So I, I wanted to introduce Rad while I also showed um, what how where this information is. So every all the meetings are listed in here under like so if we go to the meetings page, it shows you that obviously this is Rad is, is our current, and then you've got all the other meetings and ever and the events are all here. So if you want any kind of information on um, any speakers, you can come here. So like for we we look at Rad. By the way, love that picture, Rad, who has joined us now. And um, there's a nice bio in here. So yeah, so there's a <laughs> nice bio in here, which he, he's going to tell us more about himself. But you can see some of the honors that he has in here and places that he's exhibited, which are really cool. And, you know, he's been from New York to L.A. to Australia. Um, and he's an associate editor for, I guess that's Photo Pixel. Um, and then the app whisperer. So he's got all of that good stuff. And then I also wanted to show you this, which is you can go to his website and on his website, you can also say, if you're the kind of person that likes to take workshops and tours, you can do them with him. So we've got Cuba, Cape Cod, more Cuba and the Heartland are the ones that are listed. So he, he's quite the expert and we are very, very lucky to have him. And I thank the Jacksonville Camera Club and the St. Augustine Club for helping us. So with that, Rat, I'm gonna stop sharing. If I if I know how to do it, hang on, let's see, stop sharing. You are sharing your screen, stop share. There we go. So you've got the ball, Rad, you can, you, you can take it from here. Well, thank you, Liz. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thanks for that glowing introduction. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I hope I've paid you enough, but that, for that. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so I'm going to share my uh, share my desktop screen here. Um, there we go. Okay, you should be able to see my slides on the screen, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, let's. I'll go ahead and jump right in. So, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, Liz for inviting me to um, uh, to speak with Beaches, and um, I, I'm just. I think it's great that you guys have collaborated and that you have uh, the other two clubs here. Um, I'm really excited to share with you what I have tonight. I've been a photographer since I was a kid, um, and but and an iPhone photographer since my first phone in 2009. I had an iPhone 4 and I was buying a phone. I didn't even know it had a camera in it. Um, but when I found out, I was very excited about that. And it really changed my uh, enthusiasm for photography at the time. Um, so what, what we're going to do today is I'll go through some slides in the beginning, talk about some things, show you some photos, and then I'm going to share my um, share my iPhone uh, on the screen. And we're going to go through some of the um, capabilities of the um, of the iPhone's uh, native camera. So um, I just want to thank the, the folks from St. Augustine and Jacksonville for also being here today. Um, uh, I know a couple members. I think I know uh, some of you may know Jackie Kramer. Uh, she she and I are good friends, and I know she belongs to at least one or maybe all of these clubs. I'm not sure. Um, I don't see her on on tonight, but. Um, anyway, thanks for having me. And, um, I want to let you know, I'm going to make sure that Liz has these slides and, um, you guys can post them or share them however you like. The slides will have links in them to various resources. Um, some of them are things like what you see here, uh, my email, my website. I hope you'll visit that. Um, I have a new website. It's a slick pick website, which is made for photographers. And it's been really fun to work with that. Um, I hope you'll visit uh, or check out my newsletter um, and subscribe to that. I try to put one out once a month and I share things that I've learned about maybe know. new There's new tools, whether it's uh, iPhone or big camera um, and just uh, talk about learning opportunities and things that are going on. I'm in the process of posting my 2025 workshop schedule. So I'm adding things uh, every day to that. And you can see my photographs on Instagram and Facebook. I also recently started a new uh, video tutorial uh, uh, spot on the internet. It's with a company called Thinkific, and I post videos 
uh, on various topics. Some of them are uh, are free, and some of them are uh, moderately priced. So um, check, you can check that out and see the kinds of things that I offer there. So those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a dad and a grandfather. I have a three year old granddaughter named Maddie, and my grandkids or my kids won't let me share pictures of her with you, but I can tell you she's just uh, adorable. Um, I'm married to Nancy Lee. Uh, Nancy is a jeweler and a metalsmith, um, and she's done creative work for more than 20 years. Um, this is an example of what you'll see in here in, in the links. So if you click on any of the links, it'll take you out uh, to the web or wherever the resources. And this is, uh, you can go out and take a look at some of the things that Nancy does. And I, I always like to share that because she is a, just such an inspiration to me um, with the things that I do. And it's great living under the same roof with another artist. I enjoy creative writing almost as much as photography. I'm working on a little book right now of photographs uh, that inspired uh, short stories. So I sort of use the photograph as a writing prompt and then create something to go with it. I hope to have that out by the end of the year. Um, I got my start professionally with photography after graduating from Indiana University uh, and the School of Journalism there. And um, I worked as a journalist for a time. And then I went back and got my master's in education and I left professional journalism. And I, I wound up working uh, in corporate America and I spent about 30 years working for Eli Lilly and company here in Indianapolis. And in 2010, I started this business and I haven't looked back. It's been uh, the best uh, 14 years I've had, you know, doing the things that I've really enjoyed. I've had the pleasure of leading groups around the world to, you know, fantastic locations in Italy and uh, Cuba, throughout the United States, Hawaii, uh, France. It's just been a, a, an adventure. Um, and I really enjoy uh, sharing what I know. I, I consider myself a passionate creator and I love being out with my camera, whichever camera it is, whether it's out on a hilltop in the Palouse or uh, in the streets of Chicago, um, it's I just love to photograph everything. Um, what we're going to take, what we're going to take a look at tonight, um, this is our agenda, and we'll take a look at the iPhone features. So, you know what I've noticed, you know we all, most of us, many of us have iPhones or mobile phones, and we we're starting to take pictures with them more. But there are so many things that these phones do um, that you may not be aware of all of the different functions that you have at your fingertips. So I hope to, to share with that with some of that with you and show you how those work. So we'll be looking at different settings uh, and controls. We'll look at um, live mode, portrait mode, burst mode, night mode. Um, and then I wanted to give you a quick introduction to uh, making infrared photos with the iPhone, something I've been doing since the iPhone 11. Before we get started too deep into the, the, the technical things, I just wanna say it's really not about the camera. If you don't have the latest and greatest camera uh, or iPhone, there's so much you can do with whatever iPhone you have. And you know, my friend Kevin Raber always talks about, we, you know, we photographers have gas, you know, gear acquisition syndrome. We all want the latest and greatest. We want the shiniest new gadget and we want more megapixels and all of that. And it's great. And I love tech as much as anybody, but none of those things alone are going to make our photographs better. It's really about you as a photographer and the decisions you make about what you photograph, how you arrange things and all of that. And you can do that whether you've got an iPhone 10 or the latest iPhone 15 uh, Pro Max. Um, when I got started with the iPhone, I still had a day job in 2009, and I spent most of my day at a computer. So the last thing I wanted to do was come home and sit down at the computer to do Photoshop or whatever. So the phone, the iPhone, once I got working with the camera, it freed me from my desktop computer. It freed me from having to carry bags of, uh, of gear. Um, and it also um, allowed me to process images on the device and share things immediately. This was about the time um, Facebook was getting traction. And, um, you know, you could share things immediately uh, and experiment in the moment, to, you know, try something. And if that didn't suit you, you could uh, you'd make some changes and shoot again. Um, the other thing is that the iPhone is so unobtrusive. You can take photographs in places that you may not be able to take them with your big camera. And I love that freedom that it offers. The other thing that it, that it does 
and yeah. and don't don't take this wrong. I think it's really important to understand the exposure triangle and f stop and ISO and shutter speed. But with the phone, you don't always need to attend to those things. Um, all those buttons and knobs and things on your big camera, you really don't have to worry about on the iPhone because much of that is going to be handled. And you can find tools or apps that will let you take more control. But the thing with the iPhone is that so much is being done with what they refer to as computational photography. There are things be done behind the scenes when we take a photograph um, that we don't really need to attend to a lot of these things at that time. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. So it freed me up in a lot of different ways. Um, I had a bit of an epiphany last October. I was doing a workshop. It was my first all iPhone workshop that I'd done. So we've been out for a week on Cape Cod and it was our last day, full day. And we're out one morning and I looked over and I saw uh, one, one woman had her camera on a tripod doing a long exposure in infrared of the ocean waves coming in. Someone else was making portraits uh, of people walking their dogs on the beach. Um, and they were, you know, she was doing using the portrait mode in the phone. Someone else was doing landscapes or panoramas, um, long exposures. Uh, one friend had her camera in a bag under the water photographing a crab. And it hit me, we're, we're doing all these different types of photography and everyone was using the same device. And, you know, I thought about, you know, if you tried to do that with a, a traditional camera, you would have a big bag of gear, a couple of lenses, some neutral density filters and so on. Um, so it really uh, it was somewhat of an epiphany for me to, to realize that we have this leeway to do so much. Macro photography, the 13 Pro came out with uh, something called macro mode. Um, and we have the ability to, to get close to things. This is a poppy, the center of a poppy that I made in Tuscany this uh, this May. We can do these beautiful portraits um, with a shallow depth of field. So you can focus on a face, uh, it could be a pet, it could be a flower, and then you can dial in this soft bouquet behind the subject and have that beautiful blur. Um, and we'll look at how, how I like to do that using the portrait mode. I love photographing landscapes. This was here in my home state of Indiana, uh, along the Ohio River. Uh, one of the last places in Indiana that would grow tobacco here. And I love that I was able to take my iPhone, select the ultra wide uh, camera, the ultra wide lens, the 13 uh, and 13 millimeter and make this photograph with just pushing a button. I didn't have to get out of lens or change lenses or anything. It's a great way of having multiple ways or alternative ways of, of telling your story. This was a photograph I made just this June in the Palouse, um, did two workshops out there with groups. And, you know, when you look at this photograph, this was done with the 15 Pro Max using the the 1X lens, the 24 millimeter lens, which produces a, a 48 megapixel file um, and uh, in, in RAW. And to be able to process this and get the tonality and the, the colors and the sky the way it is, um, to do that with a, a mobile phone is pretty amazing to me. Um, the other thing I love about the phone is it's it's how good it is at doing panoramas. Um, these are both panoramas done in Tuscany. This was done this May, the one on top, and the one here was done in 2018. And so clearly this was a much earlier phone, probably the 10, I think. Um, this one I added some textures to and so on, but both of them, I love the lyrical lines of the second one and the clarity uh, of this one. And I've printed these, these panoramas quite large and they, they hold up and they, they look really wonderful. Um, they're also great for interiors. Um, this is the uh, Alicia Alonso Grand Ballroom in Cuba uh, where the um, uh, Cuban National Ballet dancers perform. And to be able to take this pano and show the detail of the interior of this, this beautiful building, um, I just thought the pano did a really nice job of that. The other thing we can do is get long exposures with the phone. So this photograph was made um, oh, several years ago. So it's probably the 11 Pro Max and um, handheld using the native camera and live mode. So um, if to do this with a big camera, you would certainly need a tripod. You would have to probably shoot with a, a very wide aperture to, to slow things down and to um, 
uh, and it would let too much light in. So you'd need a neutral density filter. So a lot of things like that would be going on. This was handheld without any of those accessories. Um, here's the other thing that we have now is something called night mode. If you have a 13 or later, um, you have uh, a night mode capability. And this is one of those places where computational photography comes into play. So when night, night mode activates, when the camera senses it's dark. So when it's dark, it will then decide, well, it's dark enough that we're gonna shoot for five seconds or 10 seconds. And the darker it is, the longer it, it will shoot. And it's not like a long exposure with our big cameras. With our big cameras, when we do a long exposure, we open the aperture up and we leave it open for a period of time and light continues to come into the sensor. With this, it's not a long exposure. There's no aperture on the iPhone. What happens is the phone will say, we're gonna shoot for five seconds and it will take lots of photographs during that five second period. And on each of the photographs, because you're shooting in low light, you probably it's probably taking a high SO reading, you're gonna have noise on every one of those images. But what happens, computational photography takes all of those and it stacks them together. Well, the noise on each individual image is random. So when they're stacked together, the noise disappears. So we can, and this, this was taken on the streets of Havana. This is the Alicia Alonso Grand uh, Theater on the outside. And I was hand holding the camera for this photograph. Um, I mean, to me, that's just really remarkable. Um, when I first got my phone, I walked around my neighborhood and I was, I was playing with this new lens configuration on the 15 Pro Max. Um, there's six lenses with different focal lengths and a macro tool. So you've got a 13 millimeter ultra wide, that's the 0.5X. Then there's a 1X, which is 24 millimeters. If you tap on that 1X, you get 28 millimeters, tap again and you get 35. And then you've got 48 millimeter, which is the, um, what is that, the 2X. And then you go to 5X, which is 120 millimeters. So you've got all of this, these different variable ranges with the press of a button. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's just really been exciting to, to photograph with this camera this past year. One of my favorite tools with the phone is portrait mode. And portrait mode came out with the seven plus years ago. Um, and it, it allows us to take a photograph of a person or a pet or a flower, and it creates what they call a depth map. And that depth map then can allow us to um, manipulate a, a, a simulated f-stop. So you can open the aperture wide or narrow it down. So you're, you can actually change the focal length uh, or the, the, the depth of field in the image. I think it's one of the biggest advances that we've had with the iPhone. This was taken with the 13 Pro Max. Um, and I, I love, this is a, a, a friend's dog on Cape Cod. And you can see how sharp and clear the eyes and nose are, and even this part of the body. But then I was able to dial the background down to that soft bouquet and, and you get to decide, you exercise your own creative judgment about how blurred you want that to be. Um, and it's we have so much control in the editing process. Um, this was taken with the iPhone 10, uh, 10S Max um, in Cuba. This is Havana and this farmer is making charcoal and I loved his face and his eyes and its intensity, the humility, all of those things that were present. And so I made this portrait, but I loved being able to blur that background so that you can still see the kind of the context of the area that he's in. Um, and again, this was with the older phone. So, uh, you know, this has been possible for a while. This is also with the 10S Max uh, in, in Havana, a woman selling flowers on the street. And she was very busy, but she finally had a moment and she gave me this beautiful smile. And I took this photograph using the portrait mode. And then when I processed it, I used something called stage light, which drops the background completely out and makes the subject figural in the image. And then I took this image into Snapseed and used the portrait editor to bring out the, the tonality uh, in her skin and the clarity in her eyes. It's a great combination to use uh, that, that tool. This was made uh, the, the day I got my 15 Pro Max last year out on the front, my front lawn, the, the uh, sweet gum tree. Um, and this was made with the uh, 
portrait mode also, you can see that the leaves that are on this front plane right here, they're all tack sharp. And then I use the portrait mode to, to add this, this blur that gives the image almost a three-dimensional aspect. Um, and it really, to me, this really epitomizes what the phone can do for us today. Um, the other thing is, uh, with portrait mode, now this has been blown up a little bit, probably beyond what it should be, but I wanted to show you how you can have the subject and then the blur area here. And we'll work with this image later tonight. When you're processing and choosing light modes, you've got you've got the several light modes in color over here. Then you can choose a stage light uh, high key background or a stage light mono background in black and white. So there's all of these options. This is, these are things you do after you've made the photo, after you've recorded the photo using the portrait editor. Um, another one uh, using uh, the portrait uh, mode camera in Italy, I focused on the uh, um, iris here, but I wanted to keep these, um, uh, what are those called? Those, uh, I just lost the word for them, the cypress trees. Um, those are lined the, the driveway going up to the agriturismo where we stayed. And I could dial in how much of that background I wanted to be revealed. Um, and just had a lot of fun making that photograph. So here's here's the thing with the later phones, the 14 and the 15. Um, my, my wife let me play with her Barbie dolls not long ago. And I did this, uh, I did this experiment. I made the photo using portrait mode and I focused on the doll in the front. Then I took this image into the portrait editor, which is the editor in the camera roll. Um, and when you're editing the photograph, you can tap on another location, like the, the second doll here, and it shifts the focal point to her. Same image as this one, but I've tapped here and now I've changed the focal point. Here I tap back on the third doll and changed the focal point to her. I, I don't know how the engineers make this happen, but when the photo is made, it creates a depth map and you're actually choosing different points along that map to be your focal point. So you have lots of leeway when you're when you're finishing your photo. This was taken in Italy um, and these churches, I wanted to show the, 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 the painting and, and the, the environment. So I focused on the votive candles in the foreground. And then in post-processing, when I took it into the portrait editor, I, I softly blurred the background. So you still have the context for this place and the feel of the place with a strong focal point that kind of leads you into uh, the mural in the back. So those are just some things with um, with portrait mode. I love that tool and I think it's really fun. And I'll share with you some uh, some tips on getting really good Mac, uh, portrait photos. The other thing that I love is the macro control tool that came out with the iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max. And the, um, the examples that I share here, um, this one was made with that 13 uh, Pro camera, Pro Max camera when it first was introducing uh, macro control. Um, I shot this on a high noon. I don't usually photograph flowers in the bright, harsh sun, but I really liked the contrast that I was getting here with these shadows, how close I could get and still have everything sharp. And so to me, I... I I took that photo and, and really enjoyed processing it. The one on the right is done with the 15 Pro Max two generations later. These are just some colored pencils I have on my desk and I put a black uh, background behind them and photograph them with macro mode uh, on the uh, 15 Pro Max. I'd be happy if I'd taken that with any of my cameras and to have made it with an iPhone uh, is especially satisfying. Um, Couple more, we looked at this one earlier. Um, you can just get very close with uh, macro mode. The other tool that, um, that I love that we'll look at in a minute is called live mode. And I remember when live mode came out and I hated it. I didn't understand it. I, I would take a photograph and then I'd look in my camera roll and the daggone thing would move. And I, did, you know, I didn't really fully understand what it was for. Uh, and I was always forgetting to turn it off and so on. I'm sure you've had the same experience. Well, this was taken in um, Calabria, the toe of the boot of Italy, in southern Italy. And I handheld this photograph using live mode. You can see the water is moving, so it's all soft and blurred, but everything else is sharp. 
So, and this is handheld without a tripod and without neutral density filters. This was in June. I just made this photograph in June. This is Palouse Falls um, in uh, Eastern Washington. And I, I walked up this hill, kind of a steep hill over here and got on the precipice to take this photograph. And I didn't need a tripod. I did everything was, I just pulled out my phone. I hit live mode. I handheld it and made the photograph. Um, I didn't have to carry my tripod up that hill. It just made it a whole lot easier to get up there. Um, this was uh, a couple of years ago with the 12 Pro Max on my way to Smoky Mountains for a workshop. And I stopped in the Cumberland Falls and I didn't want to carry my gear. I, I was in a hurry to get down there, but I still wanted to see this falls. So I just grabbed my iPhone and walked down the path along the river. And I used the uh, native camera, um, uh, I'm sorry, the live mode camera and handheld and got this uh, photograph. Smoky Mountains, same thing. Uh, iPhone uh, 12 Pro Max, uh, handheld with live mode. So those are just a few examples of the things that I've done with that particular aspect of the iPhone cameras. The other thing that we now have is something called night mode. And night mode allows us to get some extraordinary low light photographs that have very little noise in them and so on. And I, I explained a minute ago how that computational photography works. Um, this is a photograph of uh, the exterior of the Alicia Alonso Grand Ballroom in Havana. Uh, this was used on the cover of the PSA Journal in January uh, for that issue. Um, but this was handheld, walking down the street, stopped, took the picture in night mode, uh, probably photographed for maybe five or six seconds. In night mode, you can handhold it up to 10 seconds. If it's dark enough, it will allow you to go that long. For anything longer, if it's very dark, you can put your camera on a tripod, which is what I did for this image. This is in Tuscany this May. And I went out late uh, one evening and you can see in the distance, there's a town over here. So there's some ambient light, but I put my, my phone on a tripod and it was dark enough that it, it gave me a 30 second shooting period. Um, it has to be on a tripod because the gyroscope in the phone will will tip the phone off that a human is holding it and it won't let it go longer than 10 seconds if you're hand holding. But if you put it on a tripod, do 30 seconds. Um, and I think this is a remarkable photo um, in order to get you know the night sky and the detail in those cypress trees and so on. This is another photograph. Um, this was made in the Palouse in June this year. Um, I went out to my friend Jack Lean's house and uh, his farm, and he he has a lot of old trucks and things. This is the Milky Way on a cloudy night. We didn't have clear night, but I still like what I got. It's a on the tripod, native camera, 30 second exposure with night mode. And then I did light painting. I took a flashlight and for about two or three seconds, just yes. painted across the truck with the light. And that was it. And that yielded this image. So you can see why I, I get excited about this. There are just so many different things you can do. And one of those things that I started exploring when the 11 Pro Max was out, so that would have been like 2018 or so, I started exploring infrared with the iPhone. Now I've been shooting infrared since film days. I love the look. I think it's a wonderful way to see the world in an alternative way. And I've got big cameras that I have converted to uh, 720 nanometer infrared. But I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if I could combine my love of the iPhone with my love of infra infrared and do them both? So I started trying it and experimenting. I had a lot of help from a lot of other photographer friends. And these are the results. This is a 12 Pro Max using an app called Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor. It's a 30 second exposure on a tripod. So you get the soft water, you get those chocolate tones in the in the water over here on this side. And then all this green foliage has turned white and you've got these dramatic black lines of the bridge. I love it. I think it's really fun. And that we can do this with our iPhone just blows my mind. This was made in uh, Magnolia Plantation Gardens in South Carolina a few years ago with the 12 Pro Max handheld with uh, the night mode active. So night mode activates when you have a, that dark infrared filter over the camera lenses, it tricks the camera. Even this is a bright sunny day, but because that infrared filter is over the lenses, the camera thinks it's dark and it turns night mode on. 
Um, and that's when you get those layers of photos. Um, I'd be happy if I made this with my Fuji camera. Um, but again, to have made it with the iPhone is really satisfying to me. Uh, this also was done in uh, Palouse in June. Uh, this is an abandoned uh, grain elevator. It's been falling down for as long as I've been since like 2014 was when I started shooting in the Palouse or 2012, uh, maybe earlier than that. I don't know, 10, at least 10 years. I, I'm always surprised it's still standing every year. But here's a, this is a great example, a handheld iPhone 15 Pro Max night mode. And the blue sky here turns black with processing. The green grass here and the green back in these fields turns that white. So you get these beautiful high contrast images. And I process these in Lightroom Mobile on the iPhone um, and get these results. Um, this was in my neighborhood the, the week I got my uh, 15 Pro Max. This is in the fall, so there's no greenery to turn white. But I love the tonality, the black and white tonality that I get. Look at the, the way it handled the specular light in the tree, the way it's handled the clouds. Uh, it's just a wonderful black and white result. This was also a long exposure with the Pro, uh, Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor. Um, the wind was moving the clouds across the sky. They look almost meteoric uh, on that 30 second exposure. I, I love that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I made this photograph last week in the rain uh, here in Indiana, um, this little road, tiny little road through a very remote part of the state. Um, and again, this is a native camera. Uh, oh, wait, no, I apologize. This was the uh, Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor. Um, just a really fun way to do these sorts of images. So if that's something you're interested in, um, you can, you can learn more about it. I have a, a Facebook group that's been around for a couple of years. We have about 1500 people in that group and you can see a wide range of work that they're doing. Um, this is a link to a blog post that I wrote on four different methods for attaching an infrared uh, filter to your camera, depending on the camera you have and so on. There are several different ways. So check that out if, if you'd like. Um, I do want to say a word about raw. So, I'm guessing that since all of you are photographers and you're probably shooting with a big camera, you're probably shooting raw. Um, most of us have for years now uh, with digital imagery, it's um, the raw file gives us more data to work with. And unlike a JPEG that gets compressed, a lot of decisions get made about color and light and so on when that JPEG is made that we don't get to have input on. But when you have a raw file, you get to make decisions about some of those things in our edit, uh, raw editors like Lightroom or whatever you, whatever editor you use to edit raw files. So you have more, I think you have more creative control in the outcome. Um, and that extra data, I think you can recover details and, and really turn out some really fine images, especially if you plan to print them uh, and, and make them large. Now, a raw file needs to be processed with a raw editor. So it can be a little extra work. I mean, a JPEG sometimes comes out of the camera looking pretty good. Whereas a raw file may look a little little um, uh, muddy or not quite, it doesn't look like a, a pristine JPEG right out of the camera. You need to process it and kind of coax that goodness out of the image. Um, but I think it's worth it. And if you haven't tried it, I encourage you. Now we can do that with our phones by selecting Pro Raw. If you have an earlier phone that doesn't have Pro Raw, you can use an app like one of the Lightroom mobile cameras that will produce a uh, a DNG file, which is Adobe's open source RAW. So there are lots of ways you can produce a RAW file, even if you don't have the latest camera. This you can, I'll leave this uh, be one of the slides you have. This is my before you click checklist. So when you're using your phone, you want to make sure your settings are the way you want them. Are you shooting RAW? Do you want live on? Do you want light night mode? Do you want macro? All of these things are things that you'll get used to after a while, just kind of, it'll become second nature. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to shoot raw, but I didn't have it turned on. I shot in live by mistake and so on. So those are a quick check, looking around at those things. And then make sure I'm in the right camera mode. Do I want a fort port photo, a portrait, a pano, whatever. Um, and then for focusing, you, you know, tapping for focus and exposure. If you don't tap somewhere on the screen to tell the phone where to focus, it will decide for you. Sometimes that's okay, and sometimes it may not choose what you want. And we'll look at some examples.
you know how that works here in a second. Um, you can also lock the exposure by holding your finger down on the screen, and then you can take photographs without it having to recalculate the exposure um, and so on. Um, the other thing that's really important with the iPhone, if you're going for a high quality image, you want to avoid pinching to zoom or using the zoom dial. When you pinch to zoom in on a subject, you're, you're changing from a good zoom, an optical zoom that uses the glass in the phone to a digital zoom, which just kind of blows up the image. It's fine if you're just posting to social media and so on, it, and pretty much everything looks good out there. But if you try to print that or enlarge it to print, it's not gonna hold up if you have used the pinch to zoom. So try and zoom with your feet if you can and use one of the lenses that is on your camera at the bottom, um, whether it's the, the 0.5, the 1X, the 3X, the 5X, whatever. As long as you use one of these, you'll stay in the optical zoom. Um, Anyway, you'll have this, you know, it's just a checklist to go through. The rest of these slides coming up are, I know we all have a different iPhone. Some of you may have the 10, some of you may have the 15 Pro Max. Well, all the settings and the things may be different. So what I've done, um, I've created a, a screenshots from the 10 all the way through all of these different phones. And you can go through these on your own, find your phone in here and, and check out those uh, recommended settings. Um, I've also included some accessories if you're interested in a tripod or a bracket for holding your phone to attach to your tripod. These are some that I like. Um, I have two pocket tripods that believe it or not, I use these all the time. Uh, all you need is a flat surface to set, uh, set these on um, and they, they work wonderfully. And these links will take you out to the description of them uh, on, on the internet where you can read about them. Um, these are some of the resources. Again, I hope you'll subscribe to my newsletter and all these things. Um, I do in-person mentoring one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on Zoom. It's a great way to kind of jumpstart your uh, prowess with the iPhone um, and my workshops and so on. You can look at all this stuff uh, on your own. Um, I do want to mention one other thing. Um, you may be familiar with Topaz Labs and their product called Photo AI. Photo AI is a desktop tool. It doesn't work on the iPhone, but it's really good for iPhone images um, because you know our iPhone images are typically smaller and lower resolution than our big camera images. What Topaz Photo AI does, um, it will reduce noise, sharpen the image, and you can increase the resolution um, up to six times. And I have never seen anything quite like it. It does a remarkable job of increasing the resolution with integrity. So you can print really large if you wish. It's also great for big camera photos that you've cropped aggressively. Um, full disclosure, um, I've been using this software and I've been an affiliate with them for eight years. Um, so if you click on this link and you buy the software, I, I earn a commission. So if you do that, I thank you, but I just wanted you to know that. Um, I use this software every day and I, I love it. And I wanted to share it with you. The rest of this you can read on your own, some suggested tripods. There's that cover article I mentioned in the, the January edition of the journal, PSA journal. Um, and then I did want to mention two things. I got two workshops coming up this fall. They were both full. And just last week I had cancellation. So I have two workshop, two openings in Cape Cod Magic um, on October and in Cuba in November. So if details are here. I'd love to have you join me in one of those. Um, they're two bo both wonderful workshops, and uh, I really enjoy um, those trips, and I hope uh, that we can find some people to take those spots. So that's the end of my slides. So what I'm going to do now, this might be a point, um, Liz, where we could uh, take any qu just a few questions while I set up the uh, the sharing of my phone. Are there any questions out there at this point? Yes, we had um, one, because you said it pretty quickly, but there was a software that you were using for the um, infrared. And if you could say that name again. I think yes, you said it's, yeah, it's go ahead. kind of a long, crazy name. It's called Camera Plus Plus Sign. Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor. Okay. Um, yeah. And you use that for when you're working with your um, infrared. 
it's one of the cameras that I use for creating infrared. Yes, there are several cameras that I use, but uh, that's one of them. Um, and it's it's different. It requires a tripod because it's a 30 second exposure, but it's a really wonderful um, camera for making infrared photos. Uh, it produces a tonality that I don't see in other things. Um, I really like it. It's a camera. I thought it was an app. Well, it's an app. Yeah, it's a camera app. So, so okay. you know, they're all apps. So even the native camera that comes with the phone is an app, basically. But this is a app that you purchase from the app store, and it's a camera. It's a camera app. Okay, camera app. Got it. Okay, yeah. and we've got another one here which says, um, "How much or or little do you use?" I just lost it because the, the questions are coming in. How much or little do you use? <laughs> Hey, Glenn, we want to ask you, un unmute yourself and ask your question because it keeps scrolling away from me. He's not doing it. All right, hey, I'll do it. How's it going? <laughs> so, um, ask, yeah, ask your question. Incredible presentation. And I, like probably many people, um, am very much on offense to how much or how little do I use the phone versus the, the big camera. But I post um, bold mission with all the, the group, I post a lot more photos from my phone than I let people know about. Um, but my question is like, you know, how much or how little do you use Lightroom, um, ver, you know, connecting to mobile in the cloud? I'm trying to move into that. Uh, you also mentioned Snapseed. Just, I'd love to know, I love that product, but I kind of weaned away from it thinking it was more of a toy, but I'd be curious to see what your thoughts are. Well, so Glenn, I, I use, for processing raw files, I think the best option we have available to us is Lightroom Mobile, Adobe's product for the iPhone. It's very similar to Lightroom Classic on the desktop, and it's wonderful for processing our raw files. It's wonderful for anything, but for JPEGs or he files too, but um, it's really good. Snapseed, definitely not a toy. It is one of the most... Um, it's a very deep, comprehensive tool that lets you do editing and stylizing. Masking function is phenomenal. Um, and it's um, it's very powerful. Um, I'll, in fact, I'm actually working on a video right now that'll be in my uh, <clears throat> it'll be in that video link that I shared um, probably by the end of the week. Um, I've had to update it, but um, it's a really good tool. Um, I use it for a lot of things. Uh, or finishing things sometimes too. Okay, good. And then Nan, I over talked because I told you you, you were going to ask the questions. Do you want to ask them? Go ahead. You can keep asking them. Okay. All right. Here's another one. It says, "How can I freeze the focus on basic on the basic thirteen? Once the subject is in focus, iPhone keeps refocusing, but I think you said put the, hold the finger, but yeah, yeah. What, we're going to switch over to the phone and that'll be one of the things that I show you how to, um, how to lock the focus and exposure. It's, it's a great thing to know how to do. It really helps. Okay, good. And then let's see if this one, um, are hey, you Liz, using, Bill, I, make sure, Bill, make sure he raised his hand and wanted to ask a question too. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Bill. Bill McSherry, you're not unmuted. All right, I'll keep asking till Bill chimes in. Um, okay. This one says, are you using iPhone apps for all processing of iPhone images except for Topaz AI? I think you kind of talked about that and you're maybe going to talk about that more. Well, so, okay. So I shoot big camera and I shoot iPhone. So I use, uh, I use Lightroom on my desktop. I use Photoshop sometimes, but not a lot. I often take my images from my phone and move them to the desktop and sometimes process them there with tools like Photo AI or Nick software that plugs into Lightroom. But I also enjoy being able to process on my mobile device, my, my iPhone or a lap or a uh, iPad when I'm traveling, I don't have to get out my computer. So I do both. Um, and there are advantages to some of the desktop things over the phone, but mainly it's real estate. I, my eyes are good enough. I can still see my phone. So uh, a lot of people have issues with that and they want to have more real estate. So they want the big screen on their computer or at least an iPad. Okay. And then we have another one that says, do you use the flash? 
We have tips on flash. Well, I do. I mean, I'm going to talk about that. I don't use the flash for much. And I'll explain that, that we're going to cover that here in just a second. So if you'll forgive me, I won't, I won't take time to answer that now. That's fine. Okay. That's all the questions unless Bill McSherry is ready to chime in. Bill, you, you got your question? Actually, can I ask one more, please? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Thank do you, you see a big, sorry. is there a big difference between the camera on the uh, 14 and the 15? Um, there there are some subtle differences. Um, there's a little bit bigger sensor. You know, that's the thing about these phones. You know, Apple's put one out every year in September since 2006, I think. And each phone that comes out has features and advances that are better than the one before it. How much they matter, you know, there's a, there's a bigger sensor. There are some other video features on the on the 15, um, and the 16 is coming out next month. So we're going to have a whole new uh, a new phone to uh, explore as well. So I always tell people get the phone you can afford, and then work with what that phone will do. Okay, I did have a question, Liz. Um, the I noticed when I look at the iPhone Pro, the, the 15, it's got three lenses. You're talking about five. So some of those must be a, a virtual zoom of some sort, I'm thinking. But there may be another way that that's accomplished. Can you illuminate this? Well, if you're looking, if you see my screen right here, um, yeah. this is the 15 Pro. So I have a 0 0.5, 13 millimeter. I have a 1X, which is a 24 millimeter. Right. Um, if you tap on that, it will change to a 35 and a 48, I think. Is that right? Or uh, I can't remember. Those two are digital zooms. Okay. Um, but, the, but these, the two and the 5X are optical zoom. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We ready to move on? Yes, sir. You're ready. All right. So what I'd like to do in this next... Um, this next session section, um, I've got my camera pointed over here to my little desktop with some lights and so on. Um, and I have my camera on a tripod, not because I need to, but because it's easier for me to handle it. Um, what I want to do is walk around the interface of the phone. Now I'm using the 15 Pro Max. So if you have an earlier phone, you might not see everything that I mentioned, but a lot of this is going to be, it's been, it's the same on an earlier phone this phone may just have some additional things. So the first thing I'll talk about, we had a question about the flash. And you'll notice if you look at my, my screen here, my flash has got a line through it. I've turned it off. So I don't use the flash on the iPhone for two reasons. One, it's on the camera. So it's always facing directly at the subject. So if you're uh, photographing a portrait, it's not a good angle for the, the light to hit your subject. Uh, it's also one harsh blast of light. You can't turn it down, mitigate it, soften it, anything. So for those two reasons, I rarely use it for anything um, that I care about. I I'll use it when I'm trying to get the serial number off the washing machine in the basement, you know, that kind of thing. But for most artwork or serious photography, I, I just don't use it. Now, I'm sure there's someone out there who is doing great work with the iPhone flash, uh, but I'm not I'm not one of those people. Um, you'll notice as we go around these things here, um, there are several different menu items here. But one of the things you see is this little carrot in the center. If you tap on this carrot, it's going to open up a menu down here that is somewhat redundant of the things you see here, but, but it gives you a little more control. So let me show you what I mean. We've, we've turned off by clicking on this. I can, I can tap on that flash icon and I can, it's now on, or I can tap again and turn it off. But I could go into this little carrot here, tap on that, and it brings up this menu down here. And one of those things is the flash icon. If I tap on it down here, I can see that it's turned off, but I could turn it to auto down here so that it would only flash if the light suggested a flash was necessary or I could turn it on so it flashed every time. So I can control more things here than simply just clicking to turn it on and off up here. Um, the same is true, let's see here, if I close that up. So the same is true of other things. When you tap that carrot in the center, 
uh, you have live mode, you have your aspect ratio, you have a bunch of things that you can change down here. Um, I just tell you that because it sometimes it's nice to be able to open that up and access the, these things down here. I'm going to close that for right now and continue my little journey around the interface here. So the next thing that I see on my phone is this plus 0 0.3. That's an exposure uh, uh, slider uh, for controlling the exposure. It's telling me that right now it's at set at 0 0.3, but this is a button. If I tap on it, it brings up a dial down here and I can take my finger, I can, usually I have it set to, to zero. I usually leave it on zero, but if I'm in dark uh, situation or a very bright situation, I may adjust it. I can take this down two stops. Notice how dark the scene, the, the screen got, or I can take it up two stops. That's probably a little, you know, a little over exposed. So I'll tell you about it because there are times when you might want to use it. If you're doing night photography, if you're doing infrared photography, you may want to dial those, those down. You may want to bracket some things and try, uh, see what the results look like with, with a little bit darker or a little bit brighter exposure. Um, most of the time, like I said, I leave it here at zero. And I'm going to go up here and tap on that icon up here again, and it's going to put that slider away. There we go. So if you're sitting in a dark room right now, looking at your phone, you might see another icon up here that isn't showing right now on my camera. And that's the night mode icon. Night mode, I think it came out with the 12. I think that was the first phone that featured, offered night mode. Night mode activates when it's dark enough to come on. Right now, I've got my two lights on in my studio here, and it's too bright, so it's not activated. But watch what happens. I'm going to turn off first one light. Well, if I can hit the button, I will. There. Notice I turned off just one light. And look, now I have a one-second period of time. If I turn off the second light, now it's going to let me shoot for four, sec for four seconds. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and I'm, I couldn't read in this light right now. It's that dark. It's very dark, um, in here right now. Um, but you can see, I'm still, uh, able to see my scene. Now, what I'm going to do just for, for us today, I'm going to switch to the two X lens and get a little closer to my little waterfall in there. So, um, I can still do all the things that I would normally do to set my exposure. I can tap on the screen. I can drop my drag my finger down and darken the scene. So now I've got something like that. It's and notice now because I've changed it to the 2x lens, it's having a hard time. It's jo jostling between 18 and 20. But because I'm on a tripod, it's going to let me shoot even longer because it's dark. So I'm going to go ahead and tap the, the shutter button and look at what it's doing. It's counting down. Now on a tripod, it'll go up to 30 seconds. You can hand hold it up to 10. If I was holding this right now, it wouldn't allow it to go past 10 seconds. Um, and again, what it's doing, it's taking a whole bunch of photographs, stacking them together with computational photography. And when it does that, the noise in every image is per basically eliminated. And let's just go, it's still processing the image here. You can see it's spinning around. And we'll just go take a look at the photograph. And again, this is almost complete darkness. And look at this image. There is very little noise, even in the dark areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's very little noise in this photograph. And I know, I know we're doing this in a kind of a simulated environment here, but this is what allows us to get those photographs of streetlights and, and stars. Um, and what I wanted to show you here with the native camera, if you are ever doing this, the, the other thing, the other time this kicks in is when you're doing infrared photography. You have a 720 nanometer infrared filter on your camera and it's, it tricks the camera into thinking it's dark. And so it, it will shoot for, even on a bright sunny day, it'll want to shoot for three to five seconds or maybe only one, depending on how bright. But um there are times when you might put that infrared filter on or you're out, out on the street at night and this doesn't come on. 
Well, that's because it's gotten turned off. Well, the way to fix that is to come back here to this little carrot, tap on that, and you come down to the night mode icon displayed down here. And when you tap on it, you can see right now it's set to max, but it sometimes can get set to auto, which is a, excuse me, it's gonna shoot for a sl less time, or it can even get turned off. And when it's turned off, it will either display up here with a line through it, or it will disappear from the menu altogether. So if you're if you're intending to use night mode and, and you're in the dark and it doesn't come on, open this carrot, come down here to the dial and slide it over to max. That will force night mode to run while you take your photo. And again, you can handhold it up to 10 seconds. If you're out on a night where you're shooting stars, you want to put it on a tripod and it can go up to 30 seconds. All right. Rad, are so, we allowed to ask questions in the middle? Because somebody says, what do you mean by native camera? Na oh, I'm so sorry. Native camera is the camera that comes with the phone. So it's not a camera app. It's the one that comes with, it's with the iPhone. That's the native app, native camera. Okay, got it. And I'll tell everybody while we're doing this, this is all recorded, you guys. It's going to be on YouTube. So if you don't catch it, you can, I, I know I'm going to go back and go, well, how did he do that? So, yeah, it's a little like drinking out of a fire hose, isn't it? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, so the recording. So, yeah, the native camera, when the phone first came out, this this camera was terrible. Nobody used it. Everybody bought a camera app, a, a different one, to get a better result. But now it's gotten so good. You can shoot raw. You can do all these things. And so that's the native camera. So um, so we've looked at flash, we've looked at night mode, how to turn it on and off. Now watch, when I turn my lights on here, there's one, and it, it put it away, and there's the other one. So now it's bright enough in here, it's not, the, the night mode isn't showing up. But as soon as I turn those lights off, boom, it activates again. But if it doesn't, you can always go in and force it to turn it on. So the next thing that you see up here, um, you'll notice that I have my um, my phone set to uh, RAW Max. That's the Pro RAW iPhone flavor of RAW at the maximum megapixels, which is 48 megapixels with the, when you're using the 1X lens. Um, if you, I, I can't remember when they, the 48 megapixel is not available to phones earlier than the 15, but Pro Raw is available. I think it came out with the 11. Um, but if you don't, if you have one of those phones that should have this and you don't see it, it's because you haven't turned it on in your settings, in your phone settings. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, but I wanted to show you here, right now it's showing that I am set to make a raw photograph in uh, max, which is 48 megapixels. If I tap on that, I can turn it off. So a single tap puts a line through it. And now it's going to default to either JPEG or HEAF, whichever I've chosen in my phone settings. But this also is a button. So if I press on it, I get this menu. I can choose HEAF Max, which is an alternative format at 48 megapixels. It's awesome, very good format, much smaller file size than RAW, but still very good. Or I can shoot a 12 megapixel RAW file instead of 48. And so you've got this menu that pops up. You don't have to go into your phone settings to, to select this. It's kind of a nice feature. So I'm gonna tap RAW Max again, and there we go. And in a minute, we're going to go into the settings and I'll show you where to turn that on so you see this button on your phone. The, the next thing that we see here is live mode. Live mode is the one where it's great for doing a long exposure of a waterfall or a moving stream. It's currently off. It's got a line through it. Watch what happens when I tap to turn it on. I'm going to tap that icon right there when I tap, notice it flashes live and then it turns off raw max. You cannot get a raw format file when you're, when you're photographing in live mode. 
So just keep that in mind. It's you're going to get a lesser quality than a than a raw file, but it's still very good what you're going to get. Um, and I I use it all the time. So I've got this little rinky dink uh, fountain here, and I'm going to switch to two X and um we've got live mode on and i'm just going to tap oh on that bright spot there and i'm going to take my finger and slide down and kind of darken the the scene a little bit and i'm going to tap to take the photograph so it flashes live on the screen and that's it it's done so now when i go and and look at the photo in the camera roll <clears throat> It tells me it was made with in the live camp live mode camera. When I tap on live, I have all these things I can choose. One is loop. If I choose loop, it's just going to run indefinitely. I'm not sure what you do with that. Could be fun for something, but um, what I'm going to do is come down and choose long exposure. When I tap on long exposure. I get this and you can see when we zoom in, the water is soft, but the, everything else in the image is sharp. So that's the value of this. No tripod, no neutral density filter, and you can still get these great photos. What I wanna do is take you out to my, uh, my little area here and show you a, some examples. Uh, There we go. So these are these are photos. This was made with the 10X, I think. Yeah, the 10S, 10S Max. By the way, to get that metadata, I'm in the camera roll. I'm just swiping up on the picture and it displays the metadata down here, tells me what it was made with, what kind of file it is, and what the megapixels and megabyte size is. So all that's there just, and then swipe down to put it away. So here, this is what it looks like right out of the camera. But if I come up to live, tap on live and choose long exposure, then I get this. That's so cool. I mean, you've got this really nice soft water. Here's another one. This is a pier on Cape Cod. And you know that's what it looks like right out of the camera. You can see it's a live mode photo. When I tap live and come down to long exposure, look at this. That is so cool. This very ethereal looking Thing. And now you can take this into whatever tool, Snapseed, Lightroom, whatever, process it to your heart's content. Um, but you've got that that long exposure. Here's another one. This is a um, this is a um, waterfall in, in Cuba. And again, if I cho choose uh, loop or I'm sorry, long exposure, it's going to give me that soft water. It's wonderful. Um, I and mean, there's a whole bunch more examples here. Um, here's one. Uh, this one's already baked, so I can't show you the floor. This is Palouse Falls the year before, not not this year, but last year, uh, when they had, when they had record uh, water going over the falls, and that's a live mode photograph um, of the falls. So no tripod, you know, just the camera. So it's uh, it's just a really neat way um, to get a long exposure without having to carry a lot of gear with you. So I wanted to show you that. I'm going to turn live mode off. By the way, that's something I always forget to do. So um, it can be really irritating if you forget and, and don't turn raw back on and you end up with a bunch of live photos. Um, hey, Brad, can I, uh, we've got some questions. I'm feeling like you're shifting gears. Is this a good time for questions? Okay, or? sure. Okay. Um, so uh, Helen said, uh, does long exposure only work when you're in the live mode? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that... And does everyone have access to the metadata? And maybe you could show them again how they get the metadata. Yeah. So if you go out to your, I'll go to the camera roll here. And here's that photo we just took. And we, we set it to be a live mode or a long exposure photo. And if you take your finger and just swipe up right here in the center, just swipe up on the image it displays the metadata down here. If it's a flower or something, it'll even look up the flower and tell you the name. Um, 
but there it tells me it was made with the 14 15 pro max it's a heath file um it's um taken with the 24 millimeter camera the one x camera it's 10 megapixels now that's the other thing to know when you're doing live mode photos it's not going to give you the default 12 megapixel file size it's going to give you a lesser file size because it's actually a video clip that gets co co compiled so it's a, it's a lower um, megapixel, but there's still there's still plenty of megapixels to do stuff with. You can still print these, and if you use Photo AI to uh, enlarge the, you know, increase the resolution, you can do all kinds of things. Okay, and then on the heat while you're talking about heat files, so um, what processes a heat file? What software? well the heat files you can use it uh, the iPhone editor. You can use Lightroom. Um, most uh, the, of the standard editors now will work with a heat file. You'll, you'll encounter a few things where you try and take a heat file in and it, it won't accept it or it will either reject it or more likely it will just convert it to a JPEG and you won't even know it's happened. Um, so, but it, it, it's still, I think it's a better format um, and will give you better results. And it's also smaller than other files. It's smaller than a JPEG, certainly smaller than a raw file or a TIFF file. Um, so you can, you don't have, if storage is a concern for you, you don't have to worry about saving heat files. Gotcha. And then um, Louise asked if she should default to JPEG or HEF, but it seems like it comes out HEF. Can you, I don't think you can change, can you change it to default? Yeah, to we can. And we're going to look at that in just a second when we go into the the, uh, the settings. Okay. And I'll and show you where to, where to set that. Terrific. These people are asking such good questions. Jerry's is kind of from a way back because I made him hold still on it. He was saying when you shoot, when you shot the, like the Palouse, when you did the night sky over the truck, um, if you shoot at night for 30 seconds, do you get any motion in the stars? Um, you know, I, I would have to look back at that one. I did several and I didn't do them all at 30 seconds. So uh, you you might you might start to get like little oval instead of stars because of the long exposure but i don't think i think 30 probably not too much in 30 seconds but again what it's doing is it's taking all those photographs and compiling them so it's a little different than a long exposure at night with a big camera where if you do go too long you get those elongated stars so this is a little different um I'd have to pixel peep that image a little closer to know for sure. And I'd have to go back and look at exactly how long I let it go. Um, but I know most of them I did that night were 30 seconds. Good deal. And that's all you have right now. Okay. So, um, so that's, that's the, um, that's live mode. So <clears throat> is that where we were I kind of lost track? Yeah. So what I want to talk about again, before we move out of photo, we're, we've been working in the photo mode here rather than portrait or pano. In photo, a couple of things I wanted to talk about with you. So um, I'm going to change this to 2x just so we're a little closer to things. And I want, you know, if you don't, if you don't pick a focal point, it will choose for you. But what I'm going to do, well, actually, let me do this differently. Let me move this close, not further away. And I'll switch to 1x. So here's our image. And what I'm going to do is tap on the elephant, um, a light here on it, tap on the elephant for my focal point, And this is going to be further back. And so when I tap on the elephant and take my photograph, so you can see the square around there, that's setting the exposure value and the focal point. If I want to lock that down, we talked, somebody asked that question, how do you lock it? Well, if I take my finger and hold it on that spot, see it jiggle? It jiggles and it it's now got the auto exposure and autofocus lock. So now I can take that photo. I could I could move it a little bit this way and take it again. As long as I don't move too, too close or too far away and change the distance, I, I can take all kinds of photographs. So... Um, the other thing I wanted to show you, so we focused on the the elephant in the foreground, and it's tack sharp, but look at the frog in the background. It's soft. So you can use that to your advantage 
when you're when you're making photos. Now, if you're doing a landscape and you're photographing on the distant landscape, everything's going to be in focus. But when you have an object in the foreground, you can you focus on it and let the background blur a little bit. Um, the other thing you can do when you tap to focus, let me go back to the camera, you tap to focus, I'm going to lock it down, but then you can take your finger and lift to brighten the exposure or drag your finger down to darken the exposure. And you can just put your finger anywhere on the, the screen and drag it up and down. Typically, and here's a little tip. So if I'm out photographing a landscape and I've got a bright sky with clouds and a dark mountain range, I'm going to expose so that the clouds look right. They don't look too white. They're not too bright. They're not blown out. And the foreground, the sky will look right. The foreground may look too dark, but I'd rather have my image come out that way because when I'm processing, I can most often lift the high, uh, the shadows and reveal details in the shadows. But if I've blown out my sky, if my sky is too bright, I can't recover it. So when you're out doing your landscape, make sure that your clouds look good at the time you take the photo. And you can always take several and kind of bracket, you know, brighter, less bright, more bright. Um, and on the earlier phones, HDR is, is something you can turn on in the settings. On the later phones, I think 13, 14, and 15, HDR is already happening when you do the picture. So it's taking several readings of light and combining them into one image with a balanced exposure. Um, so, and again, I, I mentioned earlier, avoid doing this, zooming in with a two finger pinch and avoid using the dial where you dial in. Um, you can, like I say, go up to 600% um, or 600 millimeter rather. And, but I don't recommend doing that because you, you switch from optical to digital zoom and reduce the resolution. So a couple other things here um, before we move off of photo. One of the things I like about this camera is the ability to do a burst mode. And a burst mode is going to take um, a bunch of photographs really quickly. And it's great for shooting certain sports. Um, let's say you're trying to you're trying to get your dog catching the frisbee in his teeth, jumping up in the air. Very hard to time that single shot. But if you do a burst, you'll get the range of motion and you can pick out the photo you want. Um, I do this with dancers in Cuba, and I'll show you an example in a minute. But what you're going to do to do a burst, you're going to take your finger and grab the shutter button and pull it to the left. So watch what I'm going to do here. I'm going to have this elephant is going to do some acrobatics for us here. I'm going to take my finger and drag the shutter button to the, to the left and it's firing and woo, he might jump. He might do whatever he's going to do. In that time, I just took, I think about 65 photos, 66 photos. So let me go back. We're in the camera. We're going to go look at the photo and I'm going to just look at the thumbnail here. You could go to the camera roll as well, but I'm going to tap here. It tells me this is a burst of 66 photos and they're in sort of a package. If I want to look at what's in that package, I come down here to select. It's the only time you see that in the camera roll is when you have a burst. When I tap on select, it shows me all of these images and the thumbnails are down here. And look, if I drag across, I can, and it, you can see, it's like the old flip books we had as kids. It's showing me all those images. Well, I can go and say, ooh, um, that's the one I want right there where he's jumping up in the air, or that's the one I want, or whatever. You pick the one you want. And occasionally you'll get some of these that have a dot under them. The dot is the, the computer's attempt to say, this is one of the better photos in the batch. I don't always agree with it, but sometimes it is. You'll notice there's several of these here. Well, this one doesn't have too many, so it's probably out of focus the whole time. But that one, if we look at it, yeah, it's that one's in focus. So it's it has it help. When you decide which photo or photos you want, you're simply going to tap and select the photo. You can tap multiples if you want. Then you come up and say done, tap done at the top, and it will ask you, do you want to keep everything, but you know, pull that file out so you can work on it? Or do you just want to keep that one and throw everything else away? 
I rarely throw everything else away, but I'm going to right now. I'm going to say, just keep that one file. So I'll tap on keep only. And now it's saved that one file out of those 66 images. And I can begin to work with that file. Now, again, on the burst mode, if I swipe up, you can see it's a 12 megapixel image still, but it's a JPEG. Even if you're set to HEAF, to default to HEAF, it will still give you a JPEG in burst mode. Um, and we're going to look at how to set that uh, the next thing we do here. So, hey, Brad, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there was a, good, a question that said, why when I push on my photo button, does it go into video? And, and um, okay, thought... so let me just show you this one more time. That's the next thing I'm going to show you. If you, you have to drag it to the left and hold it down. So I'm putting my finger, I'm not pushing on it. I'm just dragging it to the left and holding it there. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that's burst mode. The other thing that you can do, do you, do you ever, I mean, we all know we can go down here and we can choose video, different cinematic video, slow-mo video, all that. Well, did you know you can take a photo, you can take a video and a photo at the same time? Here's how. So you stay in the photo mode. You don't go to video. You stay in the photo mode. And again, we're going to have our acrobatic elephant here. What I'm going to do this time is drag the camera button to the right and release it. Look at that. It's now activated the video. The video is now recording. It's recording a video right now. But let's say I'm, I do this with my dancers in Cuba when they do a, they do a pirouette and a leap. And I'll do the video, but then I'm, I tap this button whenever I want to still while the video is running. So here's my elephant doing his thing. And, oh, he leaps. Oh, I want that photo. And he comes back down. And, oh, he leaps over here. And, oh, I want that photo. So I tap again. And then he's going to leap over here. And I'm going to get. So I just took three photos while the video is running. So now to stop the video, I'll tap the red button. And then I'm going to go to the camera roll and look, and here is our video. It's 42 seconds. When I tap on that, it shows me that it, here's the video. If I, if I tap here, it's going to play the video and I'm, I'm speeding it up because I'm dragging my finger, but you see the video is there and it, it recorded my, my voice too. If I click, turn that on, you would hear my voice, uh, Photo. See, yeah. but so now if I go back to the camera roll again, these are the three photos that I made while the video is running. So there's one, there's the other, and there's the other. So, <clears throat> um, very cool. Now. One thing to keep in mind, if I look at the metadata here on the video or the, the stills that are made while the video is running, whoops, I'm going to swipe up. You'll notice it's only 10 megapixels. So it, it's less than even the 12 default. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Um, All right, let's move on. The other the other thing that, that I want to show you, two more things, portrait and pano. How are we doing on time? Uh, are we okay? You, yeah, you have plenty of time. Okay, so um, in that case, I want to show you one other thing. I, I want to show you how I've used that burst mode in a practical situation. So I'm going to go back out here to my camera roll and bear with me because, oops. There's no quick way to do this. I'm going to go to my bursts and then I'm going to scroll. There's no other way to do this. It's tedious, but um, here it is. So this is a burst that I did. This is a dancer in Cuba. Um, he's about to do a leap and I wanted to capture him at the top of the leap. And again, very hard to time it just right. And so I did a burst of 21 photos. Well, I, when I unpack those photos and look at what's in there, I'll tap select and there are my images. And look, I, there he is taking his start, leap. There he is at the top and there he is coming down. 
when I come back here and look, that's the one I want. Whoops. That's the one I want right there. That's the one that's at the apex of his jump. So this is where, this is why this tool is so much fun. You can really get that, that money shot, if you will, that photo of the athlete doing whatever in motion that you couldn't possibly are very unlikely to time a single photo. Okay. Back out of here. So let's take a look now at portrait mode. And to do that, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to switch over and tap on portrait. So this has been around since the iPhone 7. So I'm I'm pretty much guessing pretty much everybody has this on their phone. Um, I am going to tap here and choose. I can choose the 1X, the 2X, or the 5X on my phone. Um, I'm going to choose 1X for this demonstration. And I'm going to move my my image, my thing down here. Um, and I'm going to show you how I do this. Um, notice if you if your subject gets too close, do you see what it says on the screen? Move further away. And this natural light right here, it's grayed out. It's not active. That tells me that portrait mode is not going to create a depth map. I could take this photo right now, but even though I'm in the portrait camera, it's not active. But when I move this back a little bit, now, I, sometimes I feel like I'm playing trombone. I'm moving back and forth. There we are with our, with our elephant. It's now yellow. I don't have a message to move. It's giving me um, a good a good um, active portrait. So what I'm, I'm going to tap for focus. I could even lock it by holding down. And then I could take my finger and I could darken that a little bit or I could brighten it, whatever I want to do. I'm going to make it a little darker for some drama. And now I'm going to take the photo and I'll press the, the button. Now, before we look at that, I just want to mention, there are things that I could do before I take the photo. Notice up here, there's an F-stop. Uh, it's set to F-16. So that's simulating an F-16 aperture on a big camera. So imagine an F-16 is gonna be probably pretty small. The smaller the aperture, the, the deeper the depth of field. When you, when you move that number down and increase the aperture, the depth of field shortens. Well, you could do this before you take the photo. See, look what happens when I bring this down to a, a simulated F14. Look at my subject. Everything's blurred, but my subject is still sharp. You can do that, but don't. I say don't do it. Leave it at 16 because you can do this after you've made the shot. So you don't need to spend a lot of time messing around with your F stop because it's completely adjustable post shoot. The other thing is the same with light. You've got natural light, studio light, contour light, stage light, stage light mono, and stage light uh, key, high, high key. Um, again, I say don't, don't do those while you're setting up your shot. Set up your shot. Make sure that it's active and Go ahead and lock your exposure and set your, your exposure the way you want it to be, and then take your shot. So here we go. I'll tap the shutter button, and it just took this photograph. Now, if we go and look at it in the camera roll, there's our photo. It tells me it was made with portrait mode. So what I'm going to do is edit this file in the iOS editor, in the editor that's in the camera roll, wh which is now, these days, a very good editor. I'm going to tap on that, and there is my, um, my image, and here's my depth dial. I can dial in my focus now. So if I back this up and drop it down, now I'm focused on the elephant. You can see how sharp. I'm at f1.4, so my aperture is really big, simulated. And everything is in, in a blur behind me and in, for, and in front of me. So the next thing I can do is choose my, my light mode. So I'll come up here to the light icon on the top, tap on that. 
And then I'm just going to drag there's natural light. See the difference? Natural light, studio light, contour light. There's stage light. Look at that. It's dropped things out in the background. Now, once you've selected, and there, there's mono and there's high key. Once you've selected a mode, let's say contour light, you can come down here and adjust the lighting for that light mode. So I can slide this way and darken it. I can slide that way and brighten it up probably too much. Find the sweet spot where it's where it's perfectly um, exposed. Um, the other thing you can do, let's say you go to stage light and maybe it's too dark. It's not, it's cutting off too much of the elephant. Well, if you go back up to the f-stop icon here and you increase the f-stop from f2 to f4 and so on look how the more i bring it up i'm letting more of that background in and so you can kind of choose a spot that's a little more uh, favorable to what you're doing so the reason that i say don't worry about all of those variables of f-stop and light before you take the photo is because you really don't need to, and you can spend your time composing your image and, and setting it up that way. And you can do these other things after the fact. Um, I, wanna, I wanna just take you out and show you how this works with an actual portrait. Um, and let's see, let's do this one. This is a, a, a dancer I photographed in February in Havana. And you can see it was made with the portrait mode. And this is what it looked like right out of the camera. So I'm gonna come up here to edit, tap on edit, and oh, it's already been edited. The, I, the reason I know it's already been edited is because I have a revert button up here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna revert this because I wanna start from square one. Um, I must have edited it before. So I'm gonna revert to the original. So now I'm going to hit edit again. And now there's our original photo without any processing on it. And what I'm going to do first is take my f-stop and I'm going to blur that background so I can decide, do I want it really blurred or do I just want it maybe like that so I can still see the steps in the background? That's for you to decide. The next thing I'm going to do is go and choose my light mode here. Just tap on that. And now I've got these different light modes. There's natural light. There's studio. Look how it brightened your face from that. <laughs> to that just that one adjustment i can go then to contour light and i can go to stage light now i've dropped that background out i just think this is awesome uh, to be able to do this again i can take the slider beneath stage light and i can darken or brighten the tones in her in her skin um and the bright areas in the image so and then you can go to you could go to um stage light mono and transform it to black and white or stage light high key all within this editor. Now, if you have an earlier phone, I don't, some of these features started, the portrait mode has been around since the beginning. Some of these things I just showed you like um, stage light mono and so on have been added as the, in subsequent phones. So if you don't see some of what I'm showing you, it may be that your phone is an earlier version and it won't have all of these things. Um, but that's, I mean, that's just, that's essentially how, how this works. Now, once you've, once you've edited it and you say done, it puts it back in the camera roll. It's the same photo, just edited. The way you know it's been edited, I wish they put something here to let you know that this has been edited. The only way you can tell is if you reopen it and you see a revert button up here, which tells you it's been edited. You can always revert it back to the original file if you want, but um, that's the only way you can tell if it's been edited. What I like to do, once I get this part of it edited in the iOS editor here, then I like to take it into Snapseed. Snapseed has a portrait editor adjustment that lets you um, work with the, the quality of the skin, brightness of the face, clarity of the eyes, um, all in this one tool and it's remarkable. And so you could fine tune and finish your image using um, first the portrait editor here and then Snapseed. And it's truly, uh, I mean, it's really remarkable what you can do with that. Um, 
just to show you one of the other things you can do, this is a, a portrait. Um, uh, these dancers were, this was in, in February also. If I edit this and I uh, go to the light mode here and I switch to high key, I can get an image like that where I, it's almost a, you know, a high key background. Was there a question? We do have some questions. I think it was somebody that we probably. Oh, needed. okay. I heard we, something and I wasn't sure, but yeah, yeah. There, but we did. But it's you know what? It's not on this, so I'm going to hold it in, until. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, one thing here says: Does Snapseed edit a raw image? That that's relevant. That's a really good question. So Snapseed has a raw editor built into it called Develop Mode. You never see it unless you bring a raw file into Snapseed. The problem is. Snapseed does not do well with many raw files. Some it won't load at all. Some it will crash. And those that it does open, it, you have a very kludgy process to get the edits done. It's far better, in my opinion, to use the iOS editor, this, this editor in your camera roll, to edit that raw file first, because the this editor is a raw editor, and then move the edited version into Snapseed for fine tuning. Um, that way you get the best of both worlds. You get the advantage of the raw file with the, with the editor here, and then you get the benefits of Snapseed without having to deal with Snapseed's inferior raw editor. Really good question. The other ones can wait until you're ready for some more, um, gen more general. Okay. So, well, those are the, that's basically what I wanted to show you with, um, with portrait mode. Let me see if there was anything else. Um, I mean, that's really it. So the, the, the key takeaway here is don't spend your time worrying about your F-stop or your light mode before you take the photo. Set up your comp composition, make sure that it's active, it's yellow, and then take your photo and then worry about how you're going to do your lighting and your uh, blur and all of that. I think it's so much easier to do that. Nice. Okay. So right. you're ready for you're ready for some other questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, there was in uh it says this one here says, why wouldn't you just do a short video grab instead of a, a photo burst? Um, you can do that. There are tools out there that let you um extract a vi a, a frame from a video. Um it's just another option you have. There's a there's an app that I use sometimes called Video to Photo, where where it will you load your photo into that app and you can go in and pick whatever frame you want and save it as a file. Um, some of those don't always save as high a resolution as what the iPhone does, so you have to look at those to see, you know, if you want to use it. And I think you can also do a you can also save a you can also save a file within the iPhone. Um, from a video, but I, I haven't done that in a while. I can't remember how to, I'd have to, so I'd have to study how to do it. Um, but you can, there's, you can. Okay. And then this question is, and then Anita, I'm glad you asked this. Okay. So you, you showed us, but where that, where's the burst mode? How do you get to burst? You so the burst mode is going to be in the photo okay. camera. So mm -hmm. you're going to go to photo. And what I'm going to do for a burst, I'm going to drag the shutter button to the left and hold on to it. Left, you told us that. That was right. You answered, you answered that already. That's good. As long as I hold it, it's shooting. So okay. I just took 55 photos. And that was Jerry's question. He said, how many frames a second does it take in the burst mode? Do we, I, would, I don't know. A lot. I take... just took 60 and that was what? Maybe two seconds. I don't know. Okay. Um, that, that's okay. We won't it, worry about that. It gave me 54. I'm not sure. I could. You could probably Google it and find out. Okay. And then, Bill, make sure you raise your hand. You want to ask your own question? Yeah. Um, I had uh, really – one of them was you were showing how to edit and do all the stuff after the fact in uh, in the uh, edit function. Yeah. So what happens when you go to upload stuff to the computer? And I also noticed it, it said your recent was like 135,000. Do you ever clean them off there? Well, so uh, we're getting into kind of another area. I I have um, I use the cloud for my my storage for um, my iPhone photos. Okay. Uh, 
for photos that I that are very important to me, I will download the, those to my RAID system and my other hard drive systems that I have. Okay. Um, so, and then some I import into Lightroom for working on them there. Um, but having the cloud, it, it's inexpensive. Storage is cheap, and it I don't have to. I'm not the, I'm not the poster boy for cleaning house. I okay. don't do a good job of that. I just I just wondered if you know to keep photos like the the best photos that you get if you select several. How do you handle that? And if you shot them in something like um, not burst mode, but what am I thinking of here? Um, the one where you can choose, you know, long exposure. Um, oh, live live mode, yeah. Live mode. How you know? How does it know when you upload it to your computer? What's the final result? Well, so most of the time, I create that final result on the phone, or I get it to a point where, like, I'll take a live photo. I'll trans. I'll change it to live and select that, and then I may take it into Snapseed and edit it and do some things to it. And then, if I want to move it to the computer for some, maybe I want to use Photo AI on it or something like that. Then I will move it to the computer and continue working there. Um, and by that time, it's no longer a live photo. Now it's been processed. The original is still on my camera roll or you know in the cloud. Um, if I had to go back to it. Does that so make sense? You do live, yes, it does. If you do live photos, then you really have to keep a copy either on Apple's cloud or on the Apple phone because you're not going to be able to export the that part of the raw image. Well, you know, to, to be computer. honest, I, to be honest, I don't know what would happen if you tried to. I don't think it would. It's a video clip, so it might. Okay. A live, it might take the live mode to the desktop. I've just never done it. I don't really know for sure. But it's cool that you said that if you go take it to Snapseed, then you can export it as a single image. And does it go as a JPEG or or a? a it... Um, you whatever you've it's at this point, it's probably going to be a JPEG unless unless you've worked in Lightroom Mobile. A lot of times, I will save things back to my camera roll as a TIFF file, mm -hmm. a sixteen bit TIFF file, and then okay. I move that to the the computer and work on it in Lightroom or other something else. Okay, great. And then, okay, we got more questions coming in. Everybody's loving this. So, um, all right, let me see if I've got them in order. Um, is there a way to make more than one photo that filters in portrait mode? Did I read that wrong? Is there a way to make more than one photo that filters in portrait mode? That does what in portrait mode? I don't, I don't get that question. Yeah, this is Kimberly, I, that's my question. I didn't, <laughs> trying to think about how to write that question and listen to you at the same time. So in portrait mode, you know, you were going through the different filters you could use in post and the processing of it in the editing mode. Yeah. And is there a way to save, um, like say you wanted one, <clears throat> excuse me, studio lighting, but then you wanted one with um, a higher f-stop to blur the background could you save one of each of those sure so what you would do so right now i'm in i'm in portrait i've got um well let's see am i looking at a photo no so let's go uh to one of those i've just made a minute ago um you would just you would just uh, you would just revert it and do it over again and pull that into Snapseed and do something to it. Right. And so once you, yeah, once you've created like the file, if you take it into Snapseed, so so let's go. Let me see here if I have this. Um, did I save her? I didn't do anything with her. Let me go back. Uh, get this. So this image of this woman right here. So we just we just edited this file and we put this black background. Right. This is a portrait photo. If I if I take this. And I'll I'm going to copy the photo and I'm going to move it into Snapseed. That's this is just a way to take it into Snapseed. So I'll take it into Snapseed, paste it in there, and there's the image. And then I'm going to go down to Tools, and down here is that Portrait Mode, and I'm going to go in here and I'm going to do some stuff with the um, uh, Face Spotlight and. I'm going to, I'm going to brighten her, do some eye clarity and um, not that she needs any help with her complexion, but smoothing her skin gives a glow to the image. There's before and there's after. It's very subtle, but it's quite beautiful. Now I'm going to save that and I'm going to export it 
back to the camera roll. So we took the edited file portrait that we did. Um, we took it into Snapseed and we saved it back to the camera roll. So there's the file that we just edited. It tells us that it was edited in Snapseed, but the original file is still, now I have it in an album because of, of tonight, but the original file is still right here. And so I could go into this file again, open it up, and I could say, well, instead of the black background, I'd really rather have um, this white background. And now I'm going to say done. It's the same image. Now it's got a white background. I could copy this one, put it into Snapseed, do some processing, and save it out to the camera roll. Excellent. Thank you. That answer my question very well okay great okay and now we're jumping back this one um patrick says does your blog post give info on using the camera plus software to shoot infrared he says it, he's working on it it doesn't seem very obvious he's working on what yeah patrick you want to, are you there i'm here yeah i have camera camera plus and i've used it for a couple of years i don't use it all the time but I just took a liberty while you were talking about it to look at it and try and figure out the uh, infrared shooting, which is something I've always had an interest in and never have done. And I don't see it obviously there. And I don't want to take up a lot of everyone's time with that. But yeah. is, is that on your blog post that I can find or is it something I should uh, be able to find? More easily? Actually, right now, I, I've, I've over the years, I've had videos on how to do uh, infrared with the phone. I'm yep. in the process of updating those right now. And because so many things have changed, of course. I don't have anything just specifically on isolated on camera plus for infrared but within I even, that broader, I even did a general google search and i found nothing I'm, it's uh, you probably won't it's pretty specific i mean with i mean there's there's stuff you do you you you, you can set your kelvin temperature to 5, uh, 1400 okay um, you're going to set it up to do a, a slow shutter uh, camera within that app and the 30 second exposure so there are things you do but i don't i don't have anything packaged right now i'm working on getting it updated um, that's great. So stay tuned. <laughs> no, that's actually very, that's very helpful in what you just said. That's great. And and we have, I'm going to say we, you guys, this is so great. You, I think they could keep asking you questions forever, but we're, we're, we pretty much have bumped up on the time you agreed to give us rad. So I'm going to ask you one more question and then I think we're going to be done. Okay. And, um, so it says, is there more than one version in Snapseed, like a basic versus upgrade version? I don't remember seeing some of the no. edit options that you've mentioned. Um, if it, it may be that you haven't updated Snapseed in a, in a while, um, you, you can go out to the camera roll and make sure that you have the latest edition, uh, make sure that you don't have an update out there that you haven't installed. But there's one version of Snapseed. It hasn't been updated in a long time for very much of anything other than routine, you know, little things they do routinely. But I mean, no big changes. So the tools are, there's like 30 tools or 20, 24 tools um adjustment tools that are in that app that have been there forever there's no new tools that I, i'm aware of right. um and i'm i'm currently working i'm updating my snapseed webinar also or our tutorial and i hope to have that one posted by the end of the week so and do you have a do you have a tutorial out there on pano because somebody's um, not specifically on panos but that that was the last part of this that i was going to show you tonight which i'm I'm happy to do if you want to stay a few more minutes, yes, but I understand. Yes, you... we want to stay. Yes. All right. Well, so this is what the last thing that I was planning to show you were, was using Panos. So we looked at photo, we looked at portrait, and Pano is the one on the end here. And Panos, I love this tool. Um, again, with the Panos, you can use any of the, the camera lenses here that you have in your uh, in your camera. And it's pretty simple. Basically, what you're going to do... Um, I'm going to set this to, I'll, well, I'll leave it at 1x. And you see, it says move the phone continuously when taking the panorama. So you're going to tap the button to turn it on. You don't have to hold the button, just tap it. And then move the camera, keeping the arrow on this yellow line. It takes practice. Um, it, but notice the there's a, a little thumbnail in here. The top of the thumbnail is this top of the camera of, of the scene you see on your on your screen. The bottom of, of that is down here. So you don't have to squint and look at this little window. Look at the whole thing. Just keep the arrow on the yellow line. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to tap the button and I'm going to move 
Now you see, it tells me to slow down. That's because we're in a low light situation. If I was out in the bright sun, I could be done with this 10 times. So now there is our, our pano. Um, and I, I only went so far. This is one of the neat things about panos in the iPhone. On my Fuji, I can do a pano, but I have to go the full 180 or 220 degrees. If I stop before the end of it, it, it doesn't take the photo. This, you can do a partial pano. So it's great if you're trying to get um, a boat at a harbor and you can't back up because the ocean's there. Well, you can do a pano and get the boat in there. So that's one of the things I love about it. If you want to change direction of the arrow, maybe you want to move from left to right instead of right to left. You simply tap on the other side of the screen and it reverses the arrow. Now you can come over here, tap again, and move your camera until you get to the end when you want to stop. And there's your pano. Um, you can also turn the camera on its side and move it up and do a vertical pano. It's great for churches um, and that sort of thing. So let's go, let me show you some examples and then I'll talk a little bit more about this and you'll see what I'm talking about. So um, this is a, uh, this is a church in Ohio. Oops, church in Ohio. It's wonderful for interiors. Now notice the barrel distortion here. Those pews aren't curved. <laughs> um, that's because I'm so close to those that the, the barrel distortion comes into play. So I will use that as a creative element in my images if I, if I need to. If the further you are from your subject, the less of that you get. This is a vertical pano where I, I, instead of holding my phone, I don't know if you can see my phone here, instead of holding it like this and moving this way, I turned the phone this way and moved the camera up to make this pano. Um, this is out in the Palouse, a long summer road with the sky up above. This was taken in Tropeo in Southern Italy along the Tyrrhenian coast. And this was with the, I think, let's just see, the 10S. This is the 10S. This is like four generations ago. But look at the quality of this image. Bump, it's more of a bump than it was before. What's that? It's a little bug. So, uh, so, I mean, I've printed these large and they look great. They're wonderfully, um, they do a wonderful job. Here's a tip. So this was also taken in Southern Italy. When you have a scene like this and you have a bright sky and you're going to do a pano, come over here to the bright sky, put your finger on that spot and hold it down and lock the exposure on that bright spot. Then when you move through the pano, it's not constantly recalculating the exposure and it will give you one smooth exposure. If you don't do that and you have variability, like high, high uh, variability here in light, you can get lines through your uh, pano that will ruin your image. What happens when you do that, it'll expose for the clouds and they'll look great, but this area might be too dark or this area of trees might look too dark. But those are things you're going to fix when you process it in either Lightroom or Snapseed or something like that. You can lift those, those shadows and your image will look perfect. Um, this is another vertical pano. This is in a church in Italy. I wanted to get all of that. I wanted that beautiful ceiling and the and the uh, 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 altar and the floor. And so I did a vertical pano. This is another interesting thing that happens. I'm standing at the intersection of these three little <coughs> streets in this little town in Southern Italy. They look like they're parallel, but they're not. They're, they're not parallel at all. But the distortion makes them appear that way. I think it's a fun effect and I like, I work it. I play with that. I accentuate it when I can. Um, another uh, image from uh, Southern Italy. Here's one where I still have a little bit of barrel distortion here, but it doesn't bother me. I don't care. This is that one I showed you before. I love this image. I love the lyrical line of the hill. You can't do this with a wide angle. It, it's a pano. It's pretty much got to be done that way. So those are just some examples of um, of how I've used the the pano mode, um, and it it takes practice. It'll get you'll be frustrated because you won't keep it on the line, and your your images will have little jagged edges on the top or the bottom because you got off the line. Just just keep practicing it, and it'll get easier. Well, that's everything I had for you tonight. I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have any, and.
No, I think we are good. I think we are questioned out. <laughs> But that was a lot of, unless anybody has one that you would, it's your last chance to dive in with a question if you've got one. I think they're good. I have one. Oh, there she comes. Oh, okay. What is your must have uh, photo apps for your phone? Oh, must have. Well, um, Snapseed, Lightroom Mobile. Um, those are the, those are the two that I use. Another one called, um, um, I'll drat it all. I can't remember. I just went blank. Um, it's so many on your phone. I was wondering what what you well, really. Use. I do a lot of stylizing of images where I add textures and filters and things like that. I enjoy that. Um, Distressed FX Plus is a is a wonderful app. Uh, it has it allows you to add gels and textures to your images. It allows you to add your own textures. So if you've purchased textures, or you know, a lot of clubs don't want you using textures from other sources they want you to use your own well you can add your own textures and in, in, in distressed fx plus wonderful tool um dramatic black and white for producing black and white images remarkable it's an old app it's been around forever but it's very good and that works on iphone and android both i think um there's an app called retouch um it used to be called touch dash retouch but i think it's just retouch now I think it's one of the best content aware uh, removal products uh, that we have. Uh, it, it rivals what we can do in Lightroom, although Lightroom or Photoshop, I mean, Photoshop upgraded that recently and it's pretty good. But this lets you clone. It removes telephone wires seamlessly, um, uh, healing, everything you can imagine. Uh, and that's called touch uh, or retouch rather. Um Let's see other apps. Um, is there a let, Topaz app? There's no Topaz app for the iPhone, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Topaz okay. is desktop only. Okay. Um, and then also, um, uh, gosh, we're just gonna. It was on the tip of my tongue, and I lost it. Um, oh, Image Blender. Image Blender is also an app that's been around for years, but it allows you to blend the two images together. You can mask out parts of one image and let it come through. So it's great for composites. Uh, I use Image Blender to put my watermark on my photos that I post on um, social media. Um, so it's a, a very versatile tool. It's old, it's simple, and I love it. Nice. So those are a few. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, we're getting a lot of thank yous and excellence and thank you. And we're just delighted. So thank you so much. And I'm going to, for the rest of the questions, if anybody has them, I'm going to refer you to his website, you know, to Rad, let's say you're, it's raddrewphotography.com, I think, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you can and email me if you have questions. I mean, you know, I'm home now. I'm not traveling again until October. And I love talking about this. If I can answer any questions for you. Um, if you if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll you'll get news on when I I post new videos and things like that. So, um, but call me or email me or text me or whatever anytime. I'm happy to respond. That's great. And Jerry's um, recorded. Jerry, you're you're still here, right, Jerry? I have Jerry. recorded. By the way, hey. um, Red, I'm an IU Bloomington guy, and my good buddy Jim Brown says hello. Oh, okay. When, when were you at IU? Uh, Back in the seventies. Oh, me too. I was there <laughs> from seventy six to eighty two. Yep, we overlapped then. I was actually doing uh, photography for the athletic department back then. I'll be darned. Well, I was working with the IDS and or the uh, the Daily Student and uh, a bunch of other stuff there, and and with the city uh, papers and things at that time. Okay. Well, I'm sure we know a lot of the same folks, but we yeah. probably do. <laughs> There you go. All right, you guys. Well, um, thank you very much, Rad. And I'll, and J Jerry's going to post the video onto the Beaches Photography Club YouTube page. So anybody, and um, uh, Lynn, you and Ted can tell your members, please, that the video is going to be there. If they weren't able to attend live, it will be on the Beaches Photography Club YouTube page. And how do we get to that page? You go to YouTube and you put in Beaches Photography Club and then you subscribe to our channel and you can watch all of the stuff. It's all there. And we have it in a newsletter, Liz. So they, uh, they've they gotten a newsletter in the last week or two and it's there as well, the link. 
Very good. I know I'm going to be replaying it and practicing. So thank yes. you, Rad, so much. Well, Liz, I'll send you the slides here um, either tonight or tomorrow morning so you can post those. I'll, it'll be on Dropbox and there's a, there'll be a link. People can watch it online or they can download it if they want. But those links inside the the uh, the presentation slides will take you out to other things that you might be interested oh, in. I see that, that would be good for the links. Oh, right? yeah. The video won't have the links. Okay. So Jerry, when I get those, I'll give them to you. We'll figure out what to do. Okay. Okie dokie. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank everybody. You Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. That was great. Great. It was so great.